Hey there, honey bunnies. Welcome to episode 48, your Sovereign Storytellers podcast with your host, Michelle Wolf. Today's episode is called Money is Not Your Mommy. <laughs> you know, by now I'm sure that I'm always doing something with money. I have a monthly group on Voxer, which is $33. We use the one command every single day. We do a meditation. I lead a meditation and then people do as they do. And then I leave other, you know, book recommendations, other little bits of info throughout the month. But we're doing something every day on mon- on money. Because we know, right, It, the money is showing us that you know, there's other issues going on with us because, um, you know, we have really parentified money. We have made it Lord God and savior. We've done all kinds of weirdo shit with money. (laughs) So, um, I've taken several classes from Corey Michelle. Everything I've ever taken has made a difference. You know, I took soulful money medicine from Jody England. I've taken all, uh, all kinds of stuff from Mike Dooley. Always working on this with Esther Hicks. Like it's a thing, right? For some people, it's more of a thing than others. Um, and it has been challenging to watch the people I work with get results while I am still stuck. What that lets me know is... It's not about the money for me. For some people, it's let's unwind some money beliefs that we picked up from our family. Let's take care of just some crappy attitudes toward rich people. You know, it's not that big of a thing. It's a mental mindset thing. A lot of stuff we can fix with our mindset and a lot of thought work. And it's not that we don't do thought and mindset work with everything. It's just that for some of us, it goes a little deeper than that. So I shared on my Facebook page that I had done some lineage work with Heather Westmoreland. Um, Oh, and of course, you know, I'm such a, I'm kind of bad at marketing. Might be part of the money problem. (laughs) You can get information about the money group on my website at michellewolf.com and I am enrolling now for October we start the first of every month and all you need is to make your payment sign up for and download the Voxer app onto your phone and send me your Voxer username uh, which is sometimes different than the name you sign up with so anyway you can see that on the website what you can't see on the website is I have a one Uh, I have a half day workshop coming up September 28th for human design because human design has really factored into this money thing in a big, big way. I'm only charging $97 for that. It's two hours with a break and then another two hours ish. um, Digging into the basics of your human design. If all you ever did was master the three basics of your human design, you would turn your world around because that has really shifted this hardcore life, multiple life, multiple dimension money albatross thing that I've had going on for ever, as far as I can remember. So anyway, the, um, the workshop is called shame buster Saturday. <laughs> Because human design helps us bust through shame almost immediately. Like some people cry in their first reading. I cried when I had my, when I first started figuring it out. I didn't have a reading. I still haven't had a reading. Um, I just launched in educating myself. Anyway, that's not on the website. It's on my Facebook page. Um, Facebook.com forward slash Michelle Wolf 11. Two L's, two F's. Okay. Advertising uh, commercial end end commercial there. Okay. Um, okay. So the money thing. So I did a session with Heather Westmoreland, who is a, a healing medium. She's not like the Long Island medium. She's a, let's get in touch with the dead folk, whoever's available. I mean, an authentic medium is not going to say, yes, of course we can call grandpa Joe at 4 PM on a Saturday. You know, (laughs) people, 
<laughs> the dead folk aren't like that. So there's no promises. And she's very upfront about that, which I appreciate. Um, so she helps you facilitate going back into your lineage, whether you want to call it past lives or just DNA memory or whatever, whatever, it doesn't matter. None of the details of those things matter if they're helpful. I don't find linear past lives, life after life after life, that concept, I don't find that helpful at all. Um, in fact, I think a lot of, I have wasted a lot of time looking at past life stuff when my time would have been better spent looking at what the hell I'm doing today to avoid <laughs> the things that need to be done. You know, uh, what I believe is the multiverse, like all things happening at all times, you can access your lineage memories if you want to. So anyway, that's what we did. And I did find what feels like some significant core issues from hundreds and hundreds of years ago from an ancestor who um, the closest modern equivalent I could think of is like Nicholas Tsar, the, the last Tsar of Russia. I don't think his last name was Tsar. <laughs> Nicholas, somebody, uh, they all got shot in the basement. It was terrible. Um, but that kind of obliviousness in an ancestor, just complete, completely oblivious, very wealthy, very royal, very dumb, very not in touch with the people, very childlike. And then another ancestor later on down the road that was not quite an idiot, but not quite, um, let's say not as invested in integrity <laughs> as I am today. Like he got involved with a deal that was, he knew might have been shady and he was willing to sort of turn a blind eye. Like he didn't ask questions that should have been asked. Multiple people said, hey dummy, don't put your money there. Uh, and he ignored all that because he was super arrogant. And the arrogant thing is a thing in our family. Like I've always been shocked about how entitled we are for people who don't have anything. <laughs> like super arrogant, super entitled about intelligence really because that's that's what we have that's what we can go on or that's what we've been able to go on is our so smart minds that can't figure out this poverty thing <laughs> Ooh, we're so smart anyway i dug into that and it was very dramatic and it took it felt like having psychic surgery like it felt like parts of my insides had been carved out and restructured and put back in. Like, I really don't even know how to describe it. It was a huge emotional release, but it was more like a release down to the bone. If you've done meditation and spirituality work, you probably know what I'm talking about. If you've never done meditation or spiritual spirituality work, why are you listening to this podcast? Like none of this is going to make sense. You're going to think I'm crazy. Maybe I am crazy. I don't know. But I really hit the ground. And then um, that was uh, like Friday and the Monday was terrible. I cried all day Monday, cried all night Monday. It was horrible. And I couldn't figure out. I just assumed it was related to the work I had done. And then I remembered like four days later, three or four days later, that it was the ninth anniversary of my dad's death. So it's so interesting. Like my mind doesn't mark those anniversaries. I don't celebrate his birthday. His body has died. He doesn't still have a birthday. Um, and I don't um, do anything on the day that he died because that those dates are not significant to me. And our bodies remember the trauma when traumatic things happen and, and those anniversary dates are important because your body may still be processing um, unresolved trauma. So that's like a sidetrack, but just in case that ever happens to you, if the death, if you experience someone's death as traumatic, your body may recycle that on the anniversary date every year because it remembers, Oh, something terrible happened on this day. So let's replay it because that makes sense. <laughs> Anyway, do a little EMDR, do a little EFT tapping and, and you'll be fine. But the money thing. So we've made money our parent, right? We have looked to money 
to be our mommy. And little children, if you haven't had children, dogs do the same thing because really dogs and kids are no different. It's just two legs or four legs and a lot of, a lot more hair on one of them. <laughs> but little kids get super mad when their mommy and daddy can't do what they think they should do or don't let them do what they want to do. Like, you know, empty everything out of the refrigerator onto the floor or something crazy like that or jump off the couch when you're a year and a half. You know, kids get furious, enraged when parents don't comply. And all parents have times where a child needs something, but because you don't speak the language, you can't uh, always figure out what a baby needs. And so sometimes babies cry and their needs are not fulfilled. Either the parent can't fulfill them or won't fulfill them or whatever. Bottom line, the experience is my needs were not fulfilled. I had a need, it wasn't fulfilled, I'm pissed. That's how babies do. And if that happens over and over, then children can form the belief that they're invisible or they don't, their needs don't matter, um, you know, all kinds of stuff that then we grow up and pay coaches and therapists to get help with. Um, so we do that with money. So this week I've been reading... Um, Kyle Caesar's book, The Illusion of Money, which is a great book. He's a, he's a very funny writer. Um, and he says some unique things in there. Of course, we're all saying the same thing in different ways. We have been for thousands of years because we don't remember apparently very well. And we have to keep leaving ourselves books and things to remind us that, you know, it's not what we think it is. Pa money is not our parent. One of the exercises in that book, and then it's also an exercise I always do with clients or uh, when, it, you know, when it's appropriate, it's a handy tool is to look at life as a mirror. It's a very handy tool when you're doing shadow work because we can't see our blind spots. We can't see the parts of ourselves that we've rejected. Those show up in aggravating other people or situations. So the people, one of the exercises that therapists use a lot is go make a list of everybody that you hate <clears throat> living dead real not real um, you don't have to even know them personally but you go make a list of all the characteristics of people that you can't stand slow people dumb people um, short people you know, whatever whatever your thing is and the aggravation lets you know that's a part of you you are not in harmony with you've carved it off you've invalidated it for whatever reason you learned how lots of people have trouble with weak people because we don't want to feel our own weakness we shove that aside part of that i think is human nature to kill the weak link in the chain but we can't uh, ignore that because when we ignore the things that we reject those things keep tripping us up they hang out in your subconscious. They keep regurgitating the stories and your outside world will always match your inside story. Always, always, always. There's very few things in the world that you can be certain of, but that's one of them. Your outside life is matching your internal belief system, your internal stories, the things that you keep perpetuating, your emotional addictions. Insert commercial here. I will have an emotional 28 day emotional addiction rehab coming up in October. That's not on the website yet in commercial. Um, so in looking at money, if we take that same exercise and we consider money, finance, wealth, the world of money as a character, we sit and write down all the things that we hate about that character. It's never enough. It never shows up when I need it. It's always abandoning me. Uh, I can't get its attention. Think about right now, what, what's your relationship with money? If you struggle with it at all, and even if you don't struggle, even if you think you don't struggle with it, one of my favorite people on the planet 
sent me an email, which I haven't responded to yet, but she said that, I mean, she has plenty of money. It's not, that part's not a thing, but she, in the money group, in the monthly group, she was noticing these nuances of her relationship with money that she had sort of abdicated it and somebody else was taking care of it and she wasn't really in touch with it so even those it's not that you struggle with money that you can't pay your bills but you might struggle with money in that you don't really understand your money and the money you have you could have more of or you could be doing cool things with if you were in touch with it more so it's not always just I need more money. It might be I'm ignorant of my money, the depth of my money, the breadth of it, whatever, the qualities of money. So what's your relationship like? Do you treat it like a parent? That's what I find most often in myself and others who don't have enough money, who can't pay their bills all the time. Um, we have turned money into this thing outside of ourselves that holds all the power that's a false idol if you want to make a biblical reference like that's worshiping at the altar of something outside that's giving something outside literally that's a piece of paper with ink printed on it the power to make you feel really good about yourself or really shitty about yourself as a person. It impacts your confidence. It impacts your sense of worthiness, um, which is terrible because your sense of worthiness is what's driving how much you have or don't have. And then, you know, those numbers then make you feel more or less worthy. So it creates this loop. I can't feel worthy until I have money. But if I don't feel worthy, I won't have money. So I just keep in this loop. Um, rich people suck. Uh, everyone with money is greedy pig faces and, uh, but I want money, but I can't have it because everyone with wealth is a greedy pig face, you know, and we, we keep ourselves ping ponging in this, you know, rock in a hard place. It's Asilla and Charybdis. We're just stuck in the middle until we start really looking at it. So if we take the concept of life as a mirror, what is money trying to tell you? What parts of you have you shoved off onto this character of money so that you don't have to feel it? All the stories, all the projections, all the blah, 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 always come back to we don't want to feel. We don't want to be in our body. We don't want to feel the sensations that emotion trigger in our nervous system. We don't want to. It doesn't feel good. If you cut off and exited stage left from your body when you were three, and now you're in your 30s, 40s, or 50s and trying to get back in there, all the stuff you didn't feel is still there. All that energy is still there. And you don't know how to handle the feeling of it. You don't have to know how to handle the feeling of the feeling. The physical nervous system parasympathetic nervous system, all the hormones, all the chemicals, all the things that create sensations in your physical self feel terrible when you have blocked all that out of your awareness for years and decades. So when we make money the mommy, then we act out that rage. We act out all that unresolved frustration and feeling powerless feeling helpless against an outside authority we've made money our outside authority we used to rage against our parents who were our external authority figures now we rage against our bosses or our politicians or our dollar dollar bills y'all <clears throat> money is not your mommy money is just money deal with your mommy issues it might straighten out your money i don't know it's a place to start basically giving your power away to something like that to a number is incredibly destructive is it keeps you caught in this childlike state 
And what do children do? They blame everything and everyone. They don't take responsibility for their feelings because, you know, they're two. (laughs) They're five. You can't figure that stuff out till you get older. But when you do get older, it's that old thing. You, You didn't create the problem, but it's your responsibility to fix the problem. And is it really a problem or is it just a developmental stage that we just haven't quite gone through yet? The program I went through in college to get my master's degree for counseling was heavily focused on developmental stages and that it wasn't anything bad. It's just you never completed the development from toddler to middle, you know, school age, middle school, high school, adult, and then older adult, middle age adult, then older adult. These stages that we go through that we leave unresolved because we don't want to feel the sensations when we when we have given away our power to money when we make money our mommy and then money doesn't do what we want it to do we get really mad and really frustrated or really sad and really devastated we're acting out all this crap on (laughs) on the number on a screen or a piece of paper in your pocket I mean, when we look at it like that, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous how we're doing this to ourselves. So you know that you have parentified money. If you go look at your bank account and you have an emotional reaction. Now, this I got reminded of this in, in his book, in Kyle's book, which I highly recommend, The Illusion of Money. Go get it. There's a book club going on in the Facebook group. If you like book clubs, there's weekly live streams. Um, But he says in there, go look at your money. Think about money. And if you have an emotional reaction, then money's holding your power. I'm paraphrasing, of course. This is the same way when you do an exercise of all the people that you hate. <laughs> If you think you're fine with someone, but you sit and think about them and get mad. <clears throat> excuse me. Still ragweed season, y'all. Ugh. And mama's out of Zyrtec. I got to get some more. Um, we, If you have an emotional reaction to it, it's a problem. This is the same thing as if you step on the scale in the morning and you have an emotional reaction to the number on the scale. Ideally, It's a baseline measurement. It's a number for you to write down for you to measure progress in one direction or the other. That's it. Anything emotional attached to it is you giving your power away to the scale or the bank account or your credit cards or your debt. If you think about your debt and you tank emotionally and energetically, You've given, you've made debt more powerful than you. And what can be more powerful than you? You're the source of your own create. You're the, you're the creative source of your life. Your connection to the source, your expression of source through a physical body creates your life in what you think about because what you think about creates emotion and emotion is magnetic. And emotion writes data on your brain everything we remember the most has emotion attached to it that's why if you if you're a teacher if you can teach and pair that with emotion your your students are going to remember a lot better the best language class I ever took that was their model was to make you laugh make you have fun and teach you Spanish at the same time. And I remember more from that one day of Spanish than I do from anything else I ever did with that language. So if you have a lot of emotion around money and debt and making money and having money and all that, it's impacting your brain. And it's nothing to feel bad about. There's no need to feel shame about it. Because 100% of the time we pick up that social learning theory, we pick it up from our parents. We see what our parents do and we do the same because that's what we do. That's not a problem until we start 
carrying that into adulthood and continuing to blame our circumstances for how we feel. Now, the deeper part of that and the reason for the 28-day emotional rehab course coming up, emotional addiction rehab, I don't have a title yet. If somebody wants to send me a title, that'd be great. 28-day rehab. That So the deeper problem is, is, is you're doing mindset work and you're reading the books and you're doing all the exercises and you're doing the things and the things and the things and you still don't have money. My money has continued to get worse. Then you have to look at that emotional addiction piece, which I've talked about before. I think it's back in, it's in one of the first 10 podcasts. And it, it says it in the title, something about emotional addiction or your brain's addiction. We get addicted to chemical cocktails. And the first time I heard about this, I was in my 30s, early 30s, and I uh, was working in child protection and we were going through a really rough time. We had some very bad cases. And um, we were a small unit, only seven people, covering a huge county in three cities. Well, they're cities now. I guess they were more small cities then. This was a long time ago. But we got forced into therapy, which we all bitched and complained about. But one of the best things I learned from that therapist is this process of emotional addiction chemical addiction he showed us how it's the whole addictive cycle you think things your brain produces chemicals your body can get hooked on those chemicals and we were talking about crisis chemicals adrenaline junkie crisis junkie drama junkie that kind of stuff you find a high correlation of people who had chaotic and or abusive childhoods end up as crisis workers. You're already trained to it. You're already addicted to that state of high energy, fast energy, uh, drama energy. It's a high state of, I uh, can't, can't think of the word, agitation is one of the words but that's not what I'm stimulation I can't I can't think of the word whatever um you're hooked on it you're you know it is familiar so when you're working in crisis jobs these days I hope agencies are doing a better job of this is educating you that your body literally gets addicted to the cortisol to the epinephrine to the norepinephrine to all the things that get pumped out when your body perceives itself as being threatened, which at the core, that's what that is. Your body perceives money as a threat, an external threat that needs to be guarded against if you're at this addictive level. Or you were raised with so much fail that, failure that you've become addicted to the emotional state of failure. The chemicals produced by failure are far more preferable than the chemicals produced by success. If you're raised in a family where depression is rampant and you got in trouble for being happy, then your system is addicted to the state of depression, even if you're not actually depressed. Like even if you pick all this apart, a you may find that you aren't depressed and you never were. You were modeling that. You were mimicking what was modeled for you. Social learning theory. Google it. It's very interesting. Albert Bandura. Alfred Bandura. Yeah. Anti-Google can tell you. So that's my point of all this. We, we've made money, our mommy... We've made it an external authority figure and work it from that angle and see what shifts for you. If it still doesn't shift, then you might need to start looking at, am I emotionally dick addicted to a state of existence, a state of emotions that is preventing me from doing the work or integrating the work? A lot of us are doing the work. Nobody who lives around me and sees me in action could ever say I'm not doing the work. I'm doing the work, y'all. I'm doing the work. But it's not integrating because there's this other thing going on. 
which keeps the story in place that nothing works for me, that I'll always be a failure. You see how that works? Like our internal story is always an exact match to our external circumstances. I have an internal story that says you're always going to be a failure. Go ahead, work your ass off. It doesn't matter. You're still going to fail. So the all the work I do doesn't get down to the level that it needs to get down to to actually create the external change because that belief is stronger. Your internal beliefs, your limiting beliefs, your stories, your conditioning, if you're talking in human design terms, all those things are stronger than anything else that you're doing. So look at that. If you've done years and decades of work, you're still not getting any change. You're probably dealing with an emotional addiction fueled by some really shitty belief systems. <laughs> some things you're conditioned to, some things you were taught that don't fit where you're trying to go. So that's another thing, right? We're trying so hard to go and we're kind of forcing ourselves in a certain direction but we have these limitations in place so it we create that one foot on the gas one foot on the brake energy that feels really really terrible doesn't feel good so take a look at those things um don't make money your parent sit right now and think about money and if you feel like it has power over you then you've parentified it and you might want to do a little bit of work on that you can join my monthly money group. It's only $33. Come on. And there's a lot of shifting that happens in that month. I, I recommend people sign up and commit internally to doing 90 days of that. Because 90 days of daily work, you're going to know what the problem is. It has taken me a long time to figure out that it's not the money that's the problem. It's this embedded emotional addiction driven by some embedded ingrained thought patterns that I inherited and continued and I'm just now seeing them so that's why you can't blame yourself you can't see the stuff until you do the work so even if doing the work is not creating results you can't give up because there's something there if there's not something there it, none of this makes sense, right? There has to, every problem has a solution to it. And it, it's not necessarily serving you to keep digging for problem after problem. A lot of people talk about this and I believe it's true too. Often, you know, the more we're looking for problems, the more problems we're going to find because there's always something we could be working on. We can come at it the other way, viewing it, these things as addictive, having these addictive components and treat it like you would treat cocaine with the same principles are the same. You've got to replace your addiction with something that's better, that carries you through, <clears throat> carries you through the withdrawal period. You have to have some motivation better Something that feels better than your familiar, bad feeling, addicted place. And then you have to choose new behaviors. You have to make a plan. You have to pick a, st a stop date. You have to do some things when you're dealing with an, an emotional addiction because you're asking your entire system to reverse itself. And that's no easy job. It's a doable job though, but a lot of times you don't do it focusing on the problem. You fo you're focusing on the solution. You're looking at how good you feel in this new scenario. You're doing future writing. You're doing visualizing. You're doing the things. You're acting as if you've already kicked it. You've ar you're already a non-smoker. You're already a non-carbohydrate binger. Okay, so it's like a complex process, but it's a doable process. So if you're stuck and you've done a lot of work and you really have done the work, you aren't just saying you did the work, you really have done it. You really have shown up for yourself every day. You really have read the books and done the exercises, not just thought about them. And you're still not seeing change. It could be 
this addictive thing. And I'm going to say that for a lot of people, it's the combination of parentifying money and then creating addictions around authority and your personal power. So play with that. See what you think. Think less, feel more. Feeling really is the solution to so many of these things. So much of our thinking is just a way to create, keep that barrier in place uh, because we don't want to feel. We can train in that and that's, you know, that's another thing you have to do when you're dealing with addictive qualities, d- addictive energies. You have to train in it and you have to train every day to not overcome it, but to transform it, to take that energy and use it as fuel to create something different, something new, something more effective, something more desired. All right, I said I was going to shut up and then I just kept on talking. Anyway, think less, feel more. You know where to find me, thatmichellewolf.com. I really encourage you and hope you will join me us even you know, for one month of the money program or to really dive in with us next Saturday, November 28th, $97. It's a half day. You get your human design chart and we're going to go over it. And I'm not going to just teach you about what it is. I'm going to teach you about how to use it, how to put it into practice that very day. Um, I am not a teacher that talks about theory without also giving you practical application. We're also going to do a guided meditation, activate some energy, clear some energy. It's going to be cool. Um, So just go to my Facebook page and look under the tab events and you'll see it. Shame Buster Saturday. Hope to see you there. Okay, now I'm going to shut up. Talk to you next week.